Hey guys, welcome to the show. Subscribe, rate, review. Tell a friend on Apple Podcasts. We got to get those listeners up. We got to get those ratings up. We got to get those reviews up. I don't know. That's just what the new producer is telling me. They're like, hey, you got to get those reviews up. So I got to tell the rifters that, hey, you got to get those reviews up. Anyways, uh, you guys could also subscribe and support us on Patreon, www.patreon.com slash RazorRift61. And uh, you could be a top tier rifter for $25. A top tier rifter, as I like to call them, a rifter's rifter rifter. You get the video a couple days before, the podcast a couple days before, and a free cameo and all that stuff. Or you could be a rifter rifter, which means you just get the video the day the podcast comes out, a free cameo, stuff like that. Or you could just be a rifter, which means you get a shout out after every episode. That's right. A shout out after every episode. Anyways, I'm very excited. Uh, I've been trying to talk to this guest for a long time. This is like a Jake Weber, Daniel Stern, Christy Swanson, Dermot Maroney type of interview for me. You know, been trying to set this up for almost a year and it's finally happening. And I'm so excited. Uh, she's one of my favorite actresses. She's actually, if I'm being honest, probably my first celebrity crush. And it's always uh, a Great feeling to interview your first celebrity, uh, crush. And, um, I remember I felt I, I had a crush on her in this movie called Raging Bull. And then she did Neighbors. And I was like, oh my God, mom, dad, that's the girl I'm going to marry. I said that. And of course, this was in 1999. And I didn't realize these movies came out in like the early 80s. But at that time, I was convinced Anyways, I'm very excited. Uh, you know, this is this is gonna be great. Um, we've actually become good text buddies, so I'm I'm really excited. Uh, you've seen her in Raging Bull. You've seen her in Casper. Uh, this is the 25th anniversary of a movie she did called "But I'm a Cheerleader." Uh, you've seen her in Stakeout, uh, Copland, Forget Paris. Um, uh, it goes on and on and on. Kindergarten cop. Um, you guys are really gonna enjoy this episode with Kathy Moriarty, guys. Kathy Moriarty is gonna be here via Zoom. Unless her Zoom doesn't work, she'll be here via telephone, and then you just get me via Zoom. Which, hey, that's not a bad deal either. All right, guys. If you're here for Kathy Moriarty, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. you guys are gonna love it. And if you're a rifter. You know, support Kathy, follow her on the social medias, and go see her films. And yeah, all right, guys, enjoy this episode of Razor Rips with Kathy Moriarty. From Hollywood, California, welcome to Razor Rips with your host, Keith Razor. Hi, Kathy. Keith. Hi, how are you? You're not taping this part now, right? No, no, just the audio. Because I didn't even... Oh, okay, great, thanks. Hi, yeah. how are you? Nice to finally meet you. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for your due diligence. Yeah, All right. the first thing I wanted to say is thank you so much for dropping the restraining order for this. <laughs> very cute, very uh cute. Oh, uh, where are you out of? You're in LA. Uh, well, yeah. Are you in LA, Keith? Yeah, technically I'm in Orange County, but that's LA-ish, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, fine. Yeah, it's All an right. hour drive. Yeah. So, so I, I want. Yeah, but I, it's beautiful. What's this? Orange County's beautiful. Hello, Ella. My. My little dog wants to say hi. You want to say hi? Go ahead. Hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go on. What's Go your on dog's now. name? Can't play with mommy right now. This one is uh, is Ella. 
And then we have a Rocco and we have a Buddy and we have a Lana and we have a Norman and we have a Mr. Nello. This oh, one nice. happens to be Ella, Ella Bella. She's just a baby still, but yeah. but she's my baby. I I have a beagle. His name's Boomer. What is going on? What is this about, Steve? Oh, okay. Well, I wanted to start with uh because uh it's 25 years of but I'm a cheerleader. That's coming out, so I wanted to start with that. That's not, that's why I'm a minute late. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was doing another interview. It is 25 years. I wouldn't have known that. That was fast. Yeah, but like it's also one of those cult classic movies that just gets better and better every time you watch yeah. it. And you have a lot of those movies. But it, I've only seen it once, and I didn't see it for like 20 years. Yeah. Because I did it right before I got married, and I uh, got pregnant very quickly. So when they called me later, you know, to go to the premiere, I was about to give birth. So I didn't see it, and you know, time catches up with us, right? Yeah. I didn't realize twenty years had gone by, and I still hadn't seen it. And I have a tendency not to see a lot of my stuff or things that I'm in, but anyway. One night I finally watched it and I was like, oh my God, this movie is hysterical. It's really funny and it's endearing. So, and that was only a couple of years ago. So now it's like 25 years, right? Yeah, Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. But Look at where everybody is. Look at little Natasha Leone rocking it out. Clea, and... everybody's doing so well. I'm very proud of them. Yeah. So, so like they, they learned a little something from you, right? They're like, Hey, we work with Kathy. Yeah, We're going to be I big stars. learned star. a little something from them also. Yeah. No, I learned a lot from them. It's, you know, these are, you know, when I started, I really didn't have any training or anything like that. These kids are schooled and, you know, yeah. you know great college. They put it to use. Look, I mean, now they're all producing and, bunch of smarty pants definitely do you do you, you think know? like that that's also the it's, way like it's going is like a lot of people are producing their own stuff now like they you have to yeah you know you'd be a fool not to really um i mean it started really years ago when they couldn't pay you they'd bring on as producer you know yeah. but then you're gonna give it to some stranger where you're the one doing the work you might as well you know be part of it you know, work a little bit harder and produce it yourself yeah. or, you know, bring on producers, but reap the benefits of your hard work. Definitely. You know, yeah. yeah. So I think it's, it's a very smart thing to do. And I think it's just very smart to learn everything about the film industry, not just, you know, oh, that has nothing to do with me. I just want to act. You know, you really, you can't act unless you know how to work a camera also. Yeah, yeah. So you should become a sponge and you have the opportunity to learn other skills by all means. Know how to do everything yourself. Exactly. You know, I have restaurants in, in L.A. And, you know, one day. What happens if the chef quits? Who's going to cook? So you better know how to cook. Yeah. So you can stay open. You well, know? What restaurants in L.A. do you have? I want to come support. Uh, Mulberry Street Pizzeria. I don't have them anymore. Well, they're still there. Oh, Just okay. a little New York pizza. But even before them, I had another restaurant. And one day we caught the chef stealing. Yeah. So everybody lost their temper. And you should have waited till the shift was complete and then fire him. But they <laughs> fired him. So who? I was the only one that knew how to cook. So yeah. I ended up being a line cook. That's all right. All right. Another thing I learned. Exactly. And then uh, oh, speak, awesome. speaking yeah. of movies that you've done that have got, gotten a very good cult uh, classic and gets better and better, Neighbors, like that, I thought that was the funniest movie ever. That's know? another little cult classic, right? Yeah. yeah. That's a bit of a cult classic. Um, Neighbors, wow. I mean, you want to learn about comedy from the best, you got John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, right? Oh, yeah. Dan, Dan uh, Aykroyd's great. great. No, Dan is amazing. Dan, Dan looks at things in in his own very particular way. You know, yeah. you look down at carpet, you see carpet. Dan looks down, he sees molecules and atoms. You know, yeah. he's uh, he's so brilliant. His timing, his timing is impeccable. And on top of it, he's just a lovely man. 
He's just a genuine, just very kind, kind man. So one of the things about Dan Aykroyd is like, because I have Asperger's syndrome and he was like the very first major celebrity to come out saying he has Asperger's syndrome. So I, w- I was wondering like, uh, if you know, you, you notice the cues when you worked with him and stuff, like, does he look down a lot and is he very unsocial and stuff? No, it wasn't with me. I, uh, I do understand your point. Um, no, he, he wasn't with me. He's, you have you have what Asperger's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, a form. You, it's, yeah, it's a form of autism. Yeah, no, I know what it is. Oh, but, okay. I mean, I don't think there's a telltale sign if if you're autistic or not. I I know Dan has come out publicly saying that he has Asperger's, and I I guess the comments I just made that there was Zerinsky who. Played the tow truck driver in Neighbors. Yeah. If you remember, Alan's, he always thought that Dan didn't like him. It's just Dan's quirky. Is that right. a good word? Maybe. Yeah, that's a great word. He, I'm he's quirky. like a little quirky. Yeah. Listen, and Joan Belushi told him this. When Dan looks, when you look down in on the rug and you see carpet, what do you see? You see carpet. When Dan looks down, he sees carpet, but he sees like molecules, you know. He just yeah. explained it in that way. No, his eye contact, his social graces. You know, he loved music. No, I I don't know. I don't think Asperger's is just listen, I have lupus, you know, whatever. It's just a thing that you have. It doesn't make you handicapped or disabled or different. Yeah, yeah. You just see things in your in your life. I think it's all I, my nephew. I think I it's an, yeah, it's an, it's a, it's a, I think it's a great tool to have, you know what I mean? Because, you know, I'm very good at comedy and it seems like yeah, Dan's like very I good at comedy. comedy. Yeah. And then Dan uh, is very good. At what? I'm sorry. I said Dan's very good at comedy. Yes. Yeah. He's also, he's also a very fine dramatic actor though. Oh yeah, I mean, great. you see him and driving Miss Daisy. He, he's just wonderful in everything he does. Yeah. But you know, I met him when was what was I eighteen, nineteen years old? This is back in Saturday Night Live days. He was um, he's pretty spectacular, very genuine. Yeah. But he has a kindness and a humbleness to him. So uh, I love Dan very yeah. much. So and- very much so. He was a sweetie. And then another cult <clears throat> classic movie you have is one of my favorite movies, Casper. And uh, I had. Oh, I loved Casper. Yeah. Casper I was loved the best. Casper. That was fun. Yeah. I'll... That's so funny because the little girl in it, who's now uh, Christina Ricci, who's now 40 something years old, right? Yeah. You know, with, with kids. Um, I ran into her recently. And we spent the day together, and it was just very sweet, very kind. But um, doing Casper, it was a good story on that, because in the beginning when I went in and met for it, um, it was a different director. It wasn't Brad Sibley. Uh-huh. And I don't know what happened with Steven Spielberg, and I forget the gentleman's name. But anyway, they replaced him with Brad Sibley. And it lightened it up quite a bit. But um, that was just, it was a long time to make that movie. But to work with Eric Idle and Bill Pullman, and Dan was in it too. I know, I was going to say. I got I, to see Dan on Casper. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was wondering if you called him and said, hey, Dan, you want to do this sweet little cameo or something? Or was that just in the script? Like that's... I think it was um, Steven Spielberg that did it. Oh, It wasn't nice. me, but it um, <laughs> wasn't my movie. But um, he showed up and it was great to see him. It really was truly great to see him. And, you know, Father Guido Sarducci, you know, it just was fun. Clint Eastwood, you know, uh, that was a fun little montage that they did. And I wanted to ask but, you, um, like, yeah, that, that's, well, I like Casper. Yeah. When, when uh, you month. when you died in Casper and you became a ghost, like how how. How did you film that? Was that just a voiceover thing or did you actually like act like a ghost and then they greenlit it, you know, like they put a ghost over you? Well, they had this thing. It was called ILM. Uh-huh. It was up in San Rafael. 
And these people like live in like a box. I sent them a really nice gift kit with lots of caffeine. And um, they just sit there. And so after I had done it, while I was doing it where I was playing the ghost, I would be there in person. And there would be red dots all over me yeah. as they were doing the animation. Phil Niblett, who did the animation, just absolute brilliance, you know. I mean, I do, look at what technology has done today, which I'm definitely not savvy, but I was able to do the link on my phone, wasn't I? Yes. And I give my <laughs> got to give myself a little credit. But um, just watching them, how technical and, and what they see, their vision. They were, I, like each frame of Casper took so much time. And I wouldn't see the difference, but they would see the difference as the frames went with Casper's expressions and stuff. Yeah. So I found that very interesting to learn about that. And Steven Spielberg would come down to the set and come up with inventions of like a skateboard as I was going down the hallway, slipping down the hallway. <laughs> He'd put me on like a skateboard with a bar. He would come up. I think he was trying to destroy me, but um, it was very family oriented the movie. Yeah. So who was cooking on what day? I'd like crock pot and stuff. It just was fun. And it was long though and long hours because of the children. But the little Christina Ricci, she'd come and stay at my house on the weekends and stuff. So it just, it was just really, just very nice. Yeah. It was just a really nice experience. And then Amy Brennan, um, Amy Brennan, who ended up marrying the director, Brad Siverling. She oh, came nice. in as Casper's mom who had passed away. Yeah, so it just, it was really good. It was really good. And the script supervisor on it, Annette Hayward Carr, is now gone into directing and has directed like her third film now. So oh. that's what, 30 years now, I guess? Yeah. Longer. I forget, Casper, I think was 96? 95, maybe? yeah. 95. Yeah. yeah. But like 95, that... okay. Hey, I was close. Yeah. Know. But that, that's just another example of how you were saying before that you should learn everything because, like you said, this person now directs movies when they're, you know what I mean? So it's like a skill, just learning. Absolutely. I think my hardest, one of the hardest scenes was to blink when the wrecking ball came behind me and took out the Range Rover. And we only had two Range Rovers. And I was like, don't blink, don't flinch, just smoke a cigarette. <laughs> And, and I got, I did it. I did. They said, we only have one car, Kathy. I was like, oh God, the pressure's on. But um, that Dan was there that day. And uh, Guido Sartucci was there. Who else was there that day? It was fun. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It's like, I wanted to live there. And it was a big mansion that they built inside of, inside of a soundstage. And um, it just, you know what, Casper... Boy, that was the moment you wait for it. And they were actually, when I had signed my deal for it, the hardest part of making my deal was they were going to do two sequels to it. Yeah. And that didn't work out because um, Christina Ricci was cast. And, well, she turned into a young lady while we were shooting, kind of. Mm -hmm. So then they, they couldn't play little teenagers anymore, you know. Yeah. But uh, it was, boy, it was... That was a happy day when they said, okay, Kathy, we'd like you to do this movie. And I was like, oh my goodness. Because I had met with the first director and met, I met a couple of times and then I just figured that they just weren't going to do it. And then they revived it and they did it and I got to be part of it. So yeah, it was, um, it's one of the best you know, movies. It was a good, big. Did I lose you, Kathy? Oh, I see. Oh, I, oh, I lost I'm you for back. a second. Oh, hi, Kathy. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm back. Uh, yeah. And that, so then I want I wanted to transition to uh, forget Paris, and I wanted to ask you, what was it like being Mister Jack's wife? That was great. He and I loved John Spencer. He was awesome. And you know, he the second passed very soon after. But I, I loved working with Billy Crystal. I, I Originally, I went in, I think I read for a different part. I think that Julie Kavner did. 
And I, I knew Billy, and that I ended up doing analyze that with him years later with De Niro again. Yeah. So it's just, um, it was it was great. Forget Paris was fun, and I just I never forget. I was with John Spencer, and we were running lines. They're like, Kathy, they need you on set right away. It's like, oh my God, John, we gotta go. We're gonna be late. And we get to set, and they're singing and singing Happy Birthday. I'm like, Happy Birthday. And had gotten me a cake. And I was always would tell like a joke every day that was like really filthy and disgusting yeah. <laughs> and very vile. But Billy's like, if you could just come to set every day, Kathy, and tell jokes. I was like, you can't afford me. But he had gotten me this really big cake and said, happy fucking birthday. You know? Oh, but it was just and I love so much. Yeah. 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 It just it was very sweet. It was very sweet. It was a really good experience. Um, when I was there anyway, I had a great time. Yeah. And I had a great time. And then a stakeout. And it was out. nice to work with. Um, and, oh, another stakeout. Wow. Yeah. I forgot about that one. Yeah. yeah. Another stakeout. Yeah, that was Carelia, Rosie, um, and, of course, Richard Dreyfus and, and Madeline Stowe, who I adored. And that was, I got to work with John Badham. Yeah, you know, so that was pretty amazing. And Dennis Farina, we were at home. We were just us, you know. We just played the, the East Coast version. So yeah, great experience. And we shot that up in Vancouver on an island. So you had the choice if you were taking the boat because you were scared to fly over to the island. You had to take the boat. You had to be on it at four thirty in the morning. But if you took the helicopter, you didn't have to get up till five thirty. So I was like. Whoa. I'll be taking the helicopter. I'd rather die in the air than drown in the water. Then one night we missed curfew and I had to take the boat home. And I was petrified. Yeah. I was petrified. I knew I made the right decision. Just fly there every day. Yeah, it was great. I wanted it was to good. But yeah, no, and I, I we got to spend a lot of time up in Vancouver, which was beautiful. Yeah. I wanted to ask you because uh, uh, you in that movie you you fall in the water a lot, and I was wondering was, it, was that you or did you do the stunts or like because in the beginning you fall in the house. You know, that was yeah, right. I did that pretty good too, didn't I? Yeah, I had to when the house exploded. I had to run out. And a great stunt supervisor, um, and they had a little trampoline. I had to hit it dead on and catapult into the pool. I would never do that today. Right. By no means. Back then, I didn't have too much fear still. I did panic a little. And he's passed away now. His name was Connie, um, who just made sure I was safe and stuff. And I never forget having to hit that one little tiny trampoline under the leaves. And I was like, oh, God, if I miss it, I'm going to die, you know? Right. And then I catapulted up, and I landed in the pool, and then the pool was on fire. You know, now that I think about that, I would never do that today, would I? No, I, I would have used the stumpers, but I did now all well myself. Now that I think about it, that was pretty stupid, wasn't it? Oh well. <laughs> uh, well, you you only live once. Yeah, well, it goes right? today. You know. No, I did it twice. Uh. <laughs> I did it twice. I did one for the close-ups and one for the wide, but the house already exploded then, so it was just close up. But yeah, no, I, but I did do it, but I would never do it again now. <laughs> no. What, what no, about too many the things would break. One, where you're fighting with Emilio Estevez in the water. Ending, that we did. And then I was fighting with Richard Dreyfus in the water. He actually, he had to, I had to throw a punch, but he ended up hitting me on the wrong side. And giving yeah. me a black eye on the wrong side by accident. And I think I stood up and I was going to kill him. That was in a pool that they built inside of a sound stage that was supposed to be the lake. Yeah. But they did everything right on that. Um, you know, firearm training, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I got hurt a lot on that movie, didn't I? Now that I think about it. <laughs> I know. I was hmm. going to be like, holy Lord. Hmm. Right? We don't do. We don't do, we're not so brave anymore. We're not so brave. But then again, nowadays, I just played the grandma and I'm safe. Yeah. I'm safe. Um. So, and then I wanted to move over to Copland, which I think is one of the best movies ever. 
Like you have a lot of best movies ever. Have you noticed that? Top lounge. <laughs> I have a lot of really good stuff. I've been very fortunate in my career. And I was able to kind of pick and choose. And I've worked with some great, great people. Um, very fortunate. Copland, I think, was probably Stallone's best work he's ever done. Yeah. I thought he was great. And this time, I think I played Harvey Keitel's wife. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. You yeah know, Copland yeah. was great. You know, it was great. You had chaos, chaos there, but it was a great story. And James Mangold, who wrote and directed it, um, he was pretty fresh, but he held his own. I was so proud of him. He was so confident and so talented. You know, when you walk onto a set with all these icons and you've done, you know, three independent movies and you don't know if these people are going to respect you or listen to you or take your advice or yeah. if they're going to treat you like, all right, go back over there, kid. But they did because he earned that respect. He didn't walk on the set demanding it. He earned it from each and every one of us. And um, he did a good job, James Mancold. He really did. Yeah. He's um, he's a wonderful director and he's a really good writer as well. But he's very he's very good and he's very kind with actors. Or he was with me, I should say. I should only say for myself. But uh, he was very nurturing. So is that one of the I things that you... It because that, was rough, that was a rough crowd. <laughs> Is that one of the things you, you I was gonna say, was that one of the things you look for when you when you do a movie, like if the script and and the story's pretty good, or do you do you look about who you're working with first? I look at the script first, the story, if there's a message in it, if it touches me, if I think I can bring it to life, if I think it warrants being brought to life, and if I think I can take that character and and build on that and turn it into a human being yeah. that's how i do it <laughs> uh, you know, uh, i don't know about anybody else but yeah you no know, robert De Niro had taught me a long time ago you know to learn how to listen you can always improvise but if you can take a character even if it's not a real person or anything and just bring it to life and you can stay in character you can do anything with it then so Oh, that's it was awesome. a very smart choice. He taught me. He taught me a really good lesson. Yeah. Now, yeah, and then I, let the director do the do the rest. Yeah. Now I know, like when we were talking, you're you're filming three or four different projects. <laughs> like, does that is that hard for you, yeah. when you when it's different projects because you're like, oh, I got memorized for this one, this one. Like, does it like does it give you like anxiety or how do you deal with that? It does, because I need downtime, and I never try and do two things at once, because I feel like I'm cheating then. Yeah. So it's just I had booked many things that I would only take off in between. And then between the COVID and the strike, going back and finishing stuff, you know, that you that I never completed. So no, I don't, but I also, if I'm doing a movie, I won't do an interview or anything. I just want to do that and stay in character. And then I need a couple of days off, you know, before I can speak of other things and you know, not take away from the character. If I'm, if I'm in the depths of a film, like this last one I just did, it kind of took a bit longer than expected. And um, it was a very difficult um, subject about mental illness and addiction and abuse and all of, of those channels. And think of the actors that they had were just absolutely brilliant because it's a first time director. Yeah. And um, so he led us, to, you know, to our own devices, kind of. And I had to work with uh, this phenomenal. I hadn't I hadn't worked with her before. Uh, Mina Savari. Oh, nice. She's just magical. Yeah. I had no idea of the talent. I've worked with Eric Roberts before. I've known John Savage, uh, Bill Barrett. Just so many people and everybody knew exactly what they were doing. But to see like the magic transform, it was just beautiful. So it just was a very dark, deep piece. It's not like we laughed all day, you know, yeah. very emotional. So then I don't, I won't do anything else while I'm doing that. I like to just dedicate 110% to each thing. Um, this way I sleep much better at night than I did the best, whether it be good or bad. But what I did was my best on that given day, and then I'm content. 
That's all. Sorry, there's no makeup and I haven't brushed my hair yet. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. I was hoping uh, that the, the camera part wouldn't work. But... Oh, no, no. I'll just release the, the, the audio, so don't worry about it. I, but uh, I like to say... Uh, I'm not uh, obvious. I like, I like to say I thought I, I did a good huh? job not bugging you during your movie filming. Right? Because I was like... You know, that's why I'm doing this today, because of your due diligence and your patience. Oh. And I knew that you respected that, so I thank you for that. Because, yeah, it's some people, maybe it's easy to turn on and off. For me, I like to just leave it on all the time till I complete that. And then go just go back to being me for a little bit and then take on the next. So I actually respect that very much. And uh, it's a nice a nice way to work. Thank you for that, Keith. Of course. I appreciate it, you know. Yeah. So I had three more questions. I want to respect your time. But uh, so. Okay. Uh, so uh, who's an actor that that has made you like a better actor, like after you filmed it and they use that skill they taught you into your next project? Robert De Niro, Robert De Niro. Joe Pesci, Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, because um, they taught me. That's who I first started. John and Dan, absolutely. Sally Field, Robert oh, Downey so. Jr. Um, uh, Eric Idle taught me so much about comedy. Enduring Casper, Bill Pullman, Christina Ricci. You know, when you have the young ones teaching you, it's kind of amazing, you know, yeah. watching them, how they tick and how they work. Uh, Mina Savari on this last one was pretty special and pretty in-depth to see that magic, you know, just come forth. Uh, let me see here. Uh, um, I liked working with the Antonio Banderas and Mambo Kings. Yeah, he has huh? a nice mannerism about meatloaf. Meatloaf, who I've worked with quite often. I like I like the way he goes about things. Yeah. Um, I really have no I've really I've always gone along with everybody. I'm pretty easy. Um I don't have anybody that I really disliked. Yeah. You know, where it made it hard. I, I just I actually enjoy going to work. I got to work with George C. Scott and he took me for dinner. And talk about war stories. That was just genius. Yeah. And he just said, he goes, I think you were born at the wrong time, Kathy. And Sydney, <laughs> um, Sydney Lamont was directing it. And he said the same thing to me. You remind me of the ladies, the actors from the 50s. Oh, and I was like, I took it a as compliment. a compliment. Yeah. But it was so funny to learn about these people that, you know, like George C. Scott really actually didn't want to be an actor. He started out being a writer. Yeah. But then he ended up having to act because the actors couldn't perform what he was writing. So then he ended up becoming, you know, fucking George C. Scott. Amazing, you know. But he literally took me for dinner. We spent four or five hours over dinner and it was just awesome. It was, you know, amazing. Just the things you learn when somebody lets you pick their brain and you have questions, but you have this opportunity. I mean, how many people get the opportunity to like interview George C. Scott. Well, you're not going to have it anymore because he's passed on. But yeah, you know, Ray Liotta, Ray and I have been friends. God bless him. He's gone. Meatloaf. They're all gone now. But the little things that they taught, and we're all the same age kind of, mm -hmm. but the little things that they taught, the little tweaking of a character, things like that, little things that you just for yourself, they're only for you. I yeah. thought, well, I was like, maybe I'm cuckoo or something. Not a lot of actors have it, but we just keep it to ourselves. So I really, really, really respect things like that. It's also and like, yeah, there's a lot of people. I've learned. Yeah. It's also like when you work with people that have passed on, like you kind of, you kind of remember everything in full circle of what they taught you. You know what I mean? You do. You do. You remember your time together. But like, you know, early on, I mean, I was the last person to work with John Belushi and he passed at such a young age. Uh, but just the natural comedic timing, nothing mechanical about him, where if you look at Dan, sometimes he was so genuine, but also mechanical at the same time. 
yeah. um, different directors, their kind of quirks and and, and how they work. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of brilliance out there that that people haven't even touched on on certain people. But then when you work with people that are kind of in the same age bracket as you, and they were here three months ago and now they're gone. You don't get it at first, but they have all these memories. It's like, I can't believe they're just not here. Yeah. That's yeah. just, you know, overnight they wake up, you know, and that's kind of scary. Yeah. That's kind of scary, but also genuine in a way where, you know, there's no guarantees you're going to be here tomorrow. That's true. So do your best today, right? That is yeah. true. I mean, I, I, my best yeah. friend, my best friend was Norm McDonald and, uh, I toured with him for nine years. So like I, once he passed, that's I when had I, no idea. yeah, that's when I learned literally everything about comedy is like, I remember everything he taught me. You know what I mean? Well, he was such a natural comedian. He yeah. was, I'm sorry. Sorry, my phone's going down. He was such a natural. Wait, well, he had cancer, right? Yeah, Norm? yeah. leukemia. Yeah, yeah, he had leukemia. They yeah. took him out pretty darn quick, though, huh? I or mean, did well, he suffered for years. He had it for about nine years, and I knew he had it the last maybe year. So, you know, <laughs> he he didn't. A lot of people didn't know until after he passed. So, like, no, fact, nobody knew until after he passed. Really, nobody even knew he was ill. Yeah. I am sorry for your loss. Another one, like Richard Lewis, and I. Oh, he was the best. I, I just adore. Oh my gosh, he was the absolute best, and I, I was so taken back a couple of months ago when he passed. You know, I mean, everybody was, but to know him. And I've known him for years and I've worked with him and, he, you know, he's Richard. Yeah. Boy, you know, certain ones really hurt a lot more than others. You know, and it's just, it's hard to believe. But, you know, may they all rest in peace and fly with the angels now. Yeah. All right. That's so all. My, sad. my second to last question is, Kathy, if I can do one thing for you, Keith Reza, and mm -hmm. like, I'm a, I'm a, like, say I could do it. What's the one thing I could do for you to make you smile? You always make me smile. Your oh. patience, your karma, and your dedication. Oh, no. Nice. Um, goes without merit. Now, that's why I always got back to you. Um, you. You're just very respectful and kind, and I appreciate that. I oh. told you, I said, I have to do this. You know, yeah. I put you off long enough, but then I kept doing all the things and it was kind of crazy. It was getting a little crazy, but I have 8% left, believe it or not, on my phone. So, oh, okay. So but we yeah, should wrap you this make up. me smile. And now I got to see your face. Now I got to see your beautiful face, Keith. And um, I just think it's one. And I like the way that you don't. Do they consider Asperger's a disability? I mean, I don't. And you're very I, open about yeah. it. Yeah, I consider it like I said I don't an advantage. Yeah, so I think right. it's more of a gift than anything. No? Yeah, definitely. would it be more of a gift for you? I yeah, mean, yeah. I'm, I'm the spe um, I was a spokesperson for Autism dot org for years. Yeah, um, I'm very my my nephew is severely autistic. He has PDDNOS, so I I know a lot about it. But I uh, I think Asperger's is, is is like a gift. You're just lovely. Oh. You're lovely. And I know sometimes it might not be that easy for you. Oh, well, hmm? I know, I know you got less percentage. So let's see if I could hurry this last question. Yeah. If you could, if you go, okay. into, if you could go into a time machine and talk to a younger version of yourself and tell yourself what you know now, what would you tell yourself? Oh, wow. That's a really good question. Uh, what would I tell myself? Hang in there. Hang in there. Hmm. Wow, that's a really good question. Oh, nice. I, I, that's the first time I've heard that one. If I could look back and give myself advice at 18, don't take the subway after 11. <laughs> I would tell you, I'd be auditioning for Rachel and stay and then take, like, the subway home. And twice I got robbed, so... 
finally one day I went in. I was like, no, I can't come at nine o'clock at night. I said, yeah. I got robbed on the subway. They're like, oh my God. Um, I would have learned more. I probably, no, I did that pretty early on. I, I like learning. I like learning. And I didn't limit myself. Yeah. Because I don't think you should just have one career. I think you should be able to do numerous things. And now I would sometimes I think at one point in my life in my early twenties, after John had passed and stuff, you know, I uh, I was kind of negative. And my my advice now is whatever no matter how bad it is, there's always gonna be some good in it. Take the good out of it. That's what I go by. That's the advice I give to myself. Find the good. Yeah. Just, you know, look for it. It's in there. You don't always have to just say, well, there's this. this. It doesn't always have to be negative. There's always something in everything. And just find that good. I, you know, I, you'll, live a, you'll live a happier life. Definitely yeah. agree. That and love your children. Love your children because just like anybody in life. And enjoy life. Enjoy life. Don't limit yourself. You know, you don't need a million dollars to have fun. You know, sometimes sometimes just to walk on the beach or just uh, everybody sitting on the couch, you know, it's just nice. Spend time with each other and, and you know, cherish each other. That's all. Be kind. Be kind. That's Definitely. what I always say. Definitely agree. Mm. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. I want to respect your time. I know you got a busy day, uh, but it was an thank honor you. to talk to you. And thank you for being my best friend you for 45 well minutes. You look lovely. Nice to finally meet you face to face over a uh, over a screen. Uh, You're lovely. And really, next time you do another one next year, find me. I'd love to be on your show again. Oh, All well, right? thank you, Kathy. Bye -bye, I'm going to hold you up to that. So <laughs> Have a you great day. It. You know where to find me. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> You're the best, Kathy. Have a great day, Keith. Bye bye. You, you as okay, well. Bye bye. All right, guys. That was the interview with bye bye. With, bye. All right, guys. That was the interview uh with, with Kathy. Subscribe, rate review, and we'll see you guys next week on Razor Rifts.